I'm spending Christmas in Antarctica, surrounded by snow and icebergs and whales, and I cannot believe that just came out of my mouth. Let me take you along for the journey. This is a trip I've dreamed about since I was a little girl, since I first saw photos of Antarctica in a National Geographic magazine. And I'm so excited. I'm also really nervous. I'm going on this expedition alone. I won't know anyone else that's going on this trip with me. And even though I've done a lot of research, so much about this experience is still unknown. So let's find out together. And the trip itself starts long before I get to Antarctica. First, I gotta pack. Like the majority of visitors to Antarctica, I'm first flying to Ushuaia, Argentina, and then from there, I'm heading south to the world's most isolated landmass on a ship. I'll be sailing on the Ocean Endeavor with one of my favorite travel companies and longtime partner, Intrepid Travel. And for this trip, I'm working with Intrepid to showcase this incredible once-in-a-lifetime experience. Intrepid provides a packing list, and as I'm prepping for this trip, I'm following it closely. This is a first for me, and I don't want to forget anything. And in this case, since the environment's new to me, I would be kind of lost without the packing list. And thankfully, like many Antarctic expeditions, Intrepid also provides some gear for you, so you can save room in your luggage, and you don't have to buy those items if you don't already own them. All of course link the packing list and all the items I'm packing for this expedition as well. Okay, let's get to the good part. I should have known that getting to the end of the world was gonna take some doing. Everything was going smoothly on my trip until my third out of four flights was delayed and I got stuck in Buenos Aires. Okay, so I'm in the airport in Argentina trying not to have a panic attack because there was a weather system which disrupted a lot of incoming flights, including mine, and I missed my last flight to Ushuaia where I catch the boat. There is a standby option for me tomorrow morning, but the desk agent warned that flights tomorrow to Ushuaia are very, very full, fully booked, and they had a lot of passengers that they had to rebook. So there's a lot of people on standby, or I could try to catch a flight from an airport about an hour and a half away. First, I have to figure out a hotel. I'm just gonna book something in the Marriott app, go relax and decide what I wanna do tomorrow, because I'm not gonna miss this boat to Antarctica. I just took the best shower you can ever take as a traveler. The shower after more than 24 hours of travel when you finally make it to the hotel. I'm not in Ushuaia, I'm in Buenos Aires still. And I booked myself at a local Marriott downtown, came, got on the Wi-Fi to figure out my flight options. And it does look like my best option tomorrow is gonna be to go see if I can get to Ushuaia on standby. I'm a little nervous, but I figure I can go at 6.45 in the morning, try to get on the standby flight, and if it doesn't work out, the cruise does not technically leave Ushuaia until the afternoon of the day after tomorrow. So, absolute worst case scenario, I book a flight from that separate airport that's like an hour, hour and a half away for early in the morning, the day after tomorrow. We'll see, fingers crossed, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> this does mean that I'm gonna miss the hiking adventure that I had booked for tomorrow in Ushuaia as a precursor to the trip. But let my frantic travel fiasco be a lesson that if you're going for something that has a firm start date where you really can't miss, you can't miss the start date for the cruise because the cruise will be out in the ocean and you will miss it, definitely plan to arrive at least 24 hours early just in case there's some delays. This is very different than if I was going on a city adventure or if I was gonna explore New York, for example, I could just push things back by a day, miss a day, no big deal. This is very different. Look, I won't lie and say that I wasn't worried about the delay, but years of travel experience have really taught me to control what I can and do my best to let go of everything else when I'm on the road. So I opted for a nice dinner downstairs in the restaurant at the hotel to decompress after what had already been more than 24 hours of travel. It was a nice way to end the night and then I was off again in the morning. Okay, let's try this again. I'm going to the airport. It took some doing, as the storm had damaged 20 planes in Buenos Aires, but with the help of the most amazing desk agent at the airline and a bus to get to a whole nother airport to take a new flight, I finally made it to Ushuaia, Argentina. I don't know if you can tell from my face how exhausted I am from travel, but that doesn't matter because I'm in Ushuaia, Argentina, the city at the end of the world, the world's southernmost city, and later this afternoon, I'm gonna take a boat from here to cruise to Antarctica.
and you may have noticed, I think I pronounced it Ushuaia in previous videos, but once I arrived, I did what I always do and I asked a local and they said the H is silent and it's more like Ushuaia, so that's what I'm going with. Ushuaia is a quaint little coastal city on a hill with a walkable central area that's easy to explore on foot and there's plenty of taxis and Uber works as well. Though many of the Uber drivers I encountered did ask me to sit up front, I'm assuming because Uber isn't legal even though it's widely used by travelers there. And despite my travel delay, I did manage to explore a couple of stops in Ushuaia before getting on the boat, which I really enjoyed. I went to the Museo de Fin del Mundo in the central area, which is actually made up of two buildings close together on the same street. Now, this is a small local museum, but as someone who personally loves museums, I would recommend it. The exhibits are in English and Spanish and cover indigenous history in the region, local wildlife, European contact, shipwrecks, local government, and more. You do have to pay in Argentinian pesos and it's 3,000 pesos to enter. And there's also a cute historical garden on the side of one of the museum buildings. And very close to the museum is Enriqueta Gasturumendi's craft fair. It's a market with stalls full of vendors showcasing locally produced handicrafts. This is a great stop for gifts for folks back home and I got these cute little penguin magnets for my nephews. And when I was at the craft fair and every other place when I was in Argentina besides the museum essentially, I was able to pay with a card, with US dollars or in local currency, so it was pretty simple to shop. Then I also stopped into Ana y Juana, a cute cafe. They do have multiple locations in Ushuaia and they serve a variety of baked goods and my favorite, El Fajores, with multiple flavor options, it was so good. I had a really good cardamom latte there as well and they have Wi-Fi, so it's a good place to stop for a rest after walking around if you wanna check your email, send messages back home, etc. And then I have to tell you about the stop that was the highlight of my time in Ushuaia, which for me, made the whole hectic journey worth it, Calno Restaurant. So I heard about this restaurant when I was Googling things to do in Ushuaia and I came across Adventurous Kate's blog post. And I'm so glad I took this recommendation from that post. I had a six course tasting menu with a wine pairing at Calma. It was about 150 US dollars, including a tip. The servings were large. And then some of the courses had more than one dish to them. So it was ample food. And the menu, which changes often to showcase in season and local fish, fruit, herbs and even algae was incredible. So let me show you. There's nothing as good as bread and butter, so here we go. It is peppery. Interesting. I have to say I'm already so glad this was my first stop when I got here. And even though I arrived super late, I had to call the restaurant multiple times to try to adjust my reservation. The customer service was amazing. They were so friendly and understanding. And as soon as I got here, they sat me down and they were like, you made it. It's been stressful. Just enjoy. She's pouring a Sauvignon Blanc that is from an area by the sea. So she said it'll be not salty, but like mineral. This is the best idea I've ever had. You see how I cope with crises. Food. Wine. Mmm. That is interesting. It's very mineral. She said it, it tastes like the air around the sea, and I think that's pretty accurate. The snack course has arrived. She said eat it from left to right. Little baby lobster. She said eat this in one bite. It's going to be very crunchy. Wild caught salmon with cracker, and there's carrot and a barley emulsion as well. And then another house made cracker. The top are apples that are soaked in forget what she said. It's very hard to remember the details of all three dishes at once, but I'm excited. Mm. Mm. It's super crunchy. I love that. In the same way that if you've ever eaten a fried shrimp tail, it really tastes like fried essence of shrimp. Okay, next. Wild caught salmon. It's like a little salmon cracker. I don't know how to describe that other than the best salmon cracker I've ever had. And I would eat 20 of those. At least in my experience, a good tasting menu will give you little bits of education about local goods, local producers, local fruits, local vegetables. So whenever I travel, if I do one of these, it's like, oh, I just learned about this winery and I got a two minute long lesson on the projects that this winery has undertaken before I get my glass. Or with the bread cores, you know, they'll explain that this is a local fruit that we dry and then grind up and we use it almost to season the butter like a pepper. All of those little lessons. And a lot of times I have a hard time remembering the specific names, for example, of that fruit. But I find that 
over time doing more of these experiences throughout the world, I do learn a lot about local cuisine and also local food traditions and producers, which is really cool. So I am so immensely excited for this course. So this is a white fish that's found, she said, in the local channel here. And then this red thing is a local berry, but they also made a gel from the berry, which is this, these pink dots. There's cilantro, cilantro oil, and then the, the milk, the juice, has some rhubarb in it, which is why it's pink. I love me some ceviche. Mm. It's excellent. So I admit it still feels very cringe to film myself in public. I have a tripod on the dinner table right now and the staff has definitely been clocking it, but I remind myself that I have the coolest job in the world, even if it does feel cringe and people do stare at me. Like, my job brought me to the end of the world and tomorrow I get on a boat to go to Antarctica, which I've dreamed about since I was a little girl. So. I guess I'm gonna be cringe. I have finally made it to the main. These portions are huge, but we have sea bass, local seaweed. It's a cauliflower emulsion with, I think she said there's even a little chocolate in there. Pumpkin, green onion, this looks amazing. Also, it's wild to me that it's 10 p.m. and it's still light outside here, but I'll take it. I will take the long days to see everything, do everything. This is a once in a lifetime experience, so. Interesting. The fish is really fatty, a little bit crispy. The cauliflower emulsion is just like a nice cream underneath. But definitely has a little bit of sweetness from the chocolate. I think she said that was added. So it goes nicely with the wine. The wine pairing for this course is a Merlot, which does have a subtle sweetness to it. Mm, I'll take it. That was everything. Just everything. I had the most amazing meal at Calma. I highly recommend it if you're heading to Ushuaia and definitely make a reservation in advance. Okay, I've had my fun in Ushuaia. It's time to board the Ocean Endeavor, which is this little ship here, to make the two-day journey to Antarctica. After a quick bus ride, we boarded the Ocean Endeavor and got settled into our cabin. I'm staying in a Category 4A single porthole cabin. That is quite the mouthful. And even though it's small, it works. I'm really thankful I'll be able to get some alone time in my cabin whenever my social battery is low. Also, look out the porthole, y'all. I can't believe this is real. And then we were off. For the next two days, we traversed the Drake Passage, named for British explorer Sir Francis Drake. This stretch of water between South America and Antarctica is known to be often rough and turbulent, called the Drake Shake, or alternately calm, known as the Drake Lake. All right, midway through my first full day on the boat, and we had a bit of what they call the Drake Lake this morning, where the surf is pretty calm, there's very little chop, though we have had some swaying. However, the captain announced that that's going to change this afternoon and things are expected to get a little bit rougher, and I've already started to feel the effects of that. Um, so I have spent quite a bit of time laying in my bed horizontally because I found that personally I don't feel very seasick when I'm laying down, but when I try to stand up that is an entirely different story. Thankfully, beyond a tiny bit of chop, it was all the Drake Lake for us the rest of the way there. So I passed the time exploring the ocean endeavor. I took a morning yoga class and I had some time to get some movement in. I checked out the gift shop, which has everything from additional SD cards to cute postcards. And the Ocean Endeavor has an open bridge, so I went up and I got to take a look out from there, which was really cool. I definitely spent some time reading and relaxing in the lounges. They have drinks, snacks, tea available. And there are also briefings and lessons covering everything from glaciology to how to decontaminate our gear so that we can make sure we're not bringing anything to Antarctica that we shouldn't be. There's a spa, there's, you know, essentially I could be as busy or as not busy as I wanted to be in transit. Okay, after two days sailing the Drake, we made it to Antarctica. Come along with me. I'm going to show you what a typical day is like. So a typical morning on our intrepid expedition cruise in Antarctica starts with a wake-up call, quick breakfast, and then it's time to get ready for the day's excursions. We get on our gear, decontaminate our boots, and then head out in the Zodiac boats for an adventure. Some days we'll make a landing and we'll be able to get out and explore on land, on the snow, walking along marked routes so that we don't disturb local wildlife or wander where we're not supposed to. And on other days, we may cruise in the zodiacs around icebergs and just take in the incredible landscape while we watch for whales. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> the whole time the Intrepid crew is guiding us. They're incredible. They talk us through every step of what we're doing and seeing and make sure we understand why it's important. Telling us which kind of penguin we're looking at and how far they migrate and also helping us spot more wildlife. We just hopped out the Zodiac. We are having a landing, exploring part of mainland Antarctica today. And look, right next to the landing zone, that is a seal. So after the regular morning excursion, we'll come back to the boat for lunch and get some time to recuperate. And then in the afternoon, the excitement starts again. It's typical to have a Zodiac excursion scheduled twice daily, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. But as we hear over and over in the daily briefings, and as we definitely experience ourselves on this trip, everything depends on weather. The plan changes frequently, and one afternoon we might do some Zodiac cruising, the next, a polar plunge. I'm getting ready to do the polar plunge in Antarctica, and I'm so nervous. So they called us down over the loudspeaker in groups to do the polar plunge, and it was time for my group. So I had my swimsuit on, I put on my robe, and the music was bumping as I made my way down. The energy was electric. People were so excited, and you could just feel it. I won't lie, I was scared, but Everyone was so encouraging, and as I stepped up to the edge, I could look out over the water and see this incredible scene of snowy shorelines and peaks. And then I jumped! The water was so cold. It doesn't register for a second, but then it hits, and it's like a burst of icy tingling all over. So I scrambled out as fast as possible, took the shot of vodka I was offered, and hurried to shower. <laughs> that was exhilarating. So after all the excitement and all of the day's activities, we end each night in Antarctica with a dinner and a debriefing. So have dinner, relax, catch up with the friends you've made on the boat, and then at the debriefing, you go over the schedule for the next day so you can prepare to do it all again. That's a very typical day, and on this trip, we had four days in Antarctica to explore like this. So it's Christmas day. I'm on our last excursion in Antarctica, and I can't believe this is my life. I'll admit, even though this has been a long time dream of mine, I was very nervous to come on this trip. I've never been in an environment like this before. I didn't know anyone who was gonna be on the ship. And this was a whole new experience for me, but I promised myself that post-divorce in the next few years, I wouldn't say no to myself. Even if I was scared, I was gonna do it anyway. And I'm so glad I have. I'm so glad I got to do this trip. And I am glad I got to do it with Intrepid. If you can hear that, that's penguins nesting all around me. That's the sound they make. I've worked with Intrepid Travel before. I really like their ethos, that they're invested in responsible travel, that they offset the carbon emissions produced by the travelers on their trips, that they're a B Corp, all of that. And I'm even glad I came on this trip solo, even though that part really scared me. I've never gone on a cruise before at all, so this was totally new, but the environment on this ship, which is a smaller ship, it was so welcoming. I made new friends. I got to meet people from all over the world, and it really pushed me to get outside of my comfort zone. On top of that, smaller ships like ours are able to sail two parts of Antarctica and get to places that bigger ships just can't go because they can't fit or the water's not deep enough, et cetera, et cetera. So this, has been everything and I've had so many moments on this trip where I'm like is this really my life after this we'll have Christmas dinner and a Christmas party and then begin the long journey home okay I just got back to the boat and oh my gosh so our final excursion had ended or I thought it had ended and we've gotten the zodiac boats to leave the island and come back to the to the ship and we realized while we were in the Zodiac that there were humpback whales all around us on, on the left side, on the right side, behind us. So we cut the engine to just wait and see what happened. And for 45 minutes to an hour, these whales all around us, some closer, some further, they came up, they were feeding. We could hear the air as they came up to the surface, like as they expelled air. And right as we were getting ready to, to call it quits because we were getting cold and they didn't seem bothered by us, but we were like, we're gonna leave them alone. Right as we were getting ready to come back the, to the ship, a few of them came up right next to us, and it was incredible. He's right next to the boat. Oh my god.
Every day was like that in Antarctica, and it's really hard to describe how stunning and majestic the landscape and the wildlife are. So let me try to show you. Here's some of the footage I took on the trip, and also some footage from Andrew Miller of Capture North Studios, who was one of the expedition photographers that was on the boat with us. Okay, conditions are changing. We just had Christmas dinner. There's a Christmas party ongoing upstairs, but they just came into my room and they closed the porthole. They said, it's gonna be rough seas the entire way home. I think we are about to get some of the Drake shake. I am gonna go back upstairs for the Christmas party, but I just put on my seasickness bands and I'm gonna take some of my seasickness medication now as a preemptive measure. We will see how it goes. <laughs> When I went to sleep, I put my water bottle right here so it wouldn't fall off the desk. And I just woke up and it's down there. <laughs> okay, so watch the horizon. See how much ocean and horizon we're seeing? And then watch how little we see. That I think is the best way to illustrate the Drake shake and what we're feeling right now. Since we've had quite a bit of the Drake shake on the way back, I've spent most of the time sleeping, though I have managed to creep upstairs for meals a few times. And from the emptiness of the dining hall, it seems that many people have been sick, but we are approaching Ushuaia, Argentina. And of course, of course we have an update. We've been told that if we plan to disembark the boat tomorrow and go directly to the airport and fly home, we should rebook our flights. That because of weather, our disembarkation is going to be delayed, which means anyone who's booked tomorrow, which was me, that was my original plan, will be missing their flight and we have to pivot. And honestly, that's just emblematic of this whole Antarctica experience and not necessarily in a bad way. It's just so much of this experience is weather dependent. And when we were in Antarctica and making our landings, one morning we thought we would land on this island and we get there and the winds are too high and the water's too choppy and they can't take us out. So we pivot and the boat moves to another landing spot and we try from there or we change activities and that's just part of the experience so I'm trying to go with it. So my plan for now is to rebook my flight, find a hotel, find fun stuff to do in Ushuaia, maybe I can go on the hiking excursion or do something similar that I had planned to do on the way in but I missed that because of weather in Buenos Aires and make the most of having time, free time, in Argentina in this beautiful little coastal city over the holidays. We'll see how it goes. We're in the lounge on the ship. We can see the dock, but we are not going there. And we have no idea when we're getting off. There's still weather, there's still high winds, there's still a traffic jam at the pier with all these boats that got stuck just like us. We have no plans. It's 7 p.m. and I think we're about to dock. I think we're about to get off the ship. We've been waiting all day. Look around us, there are boats everywhere just waiting now that the weather has cleared a little bit to try to get into the harbor. 15 hours later. <laughs> it is still absolutely gorgeous though. I mean, look at it. Da, da, da. And then eventually I will get to a hotel there and have time to explore now that my flight has been delayed by two days. <laughs> I've been corrected. We've actually been delayed 12 hours already. <laughs> time doesn't exist right now. But honestly, the team has been great about it. They had snack time and story time and briefings and sessions, and they're like, we're gonna keep you entertained and feed you, we promise. But this is part of the experience. <laughs> Stop it, I'm trying to film. Psych, uh, we tried, still too windy. We will not be getting off the boat right now. <laughs> they announced we're gonna try again later. I think we've parked. <laughs> we finally made it off the ship. Shout out to the whole crew and intrepid guides who managed to keep a boatload of people fed and entertained while we waited. They took such good care of us. Thankfully, I managed to rebook my flight and get a hotel in Ushuaia until it's time for me to make the long trip home tomorrow. So that's out of the way. But I woke up this morning and I realized I'm so tired. Now, old me would already be on a bus to the park 
to hike and get footage and try to make the best possible vlog I can make and also to experience the nature. I do love being outside, I love nature. But I'm tired, I've been working and on the road for weeks and I have some big projects coming up. So wiser me, who has learned the lessons of the past, is gonna take a break. So the most exciting thing I'm gonna do today is walk into town and get a cup of coffee. I think that's it for me. And if I do stumble across anything else in Ushuaia I think folks should check out, I'll make sure to put it in the caption. But shout out to Intrepid, who's truly one of my favorite brand partners who worked with me on this and other projects over the years. This is one of the most incredible experiences of my entire life. And if you have the chance to go to Antarctica or take an Intrepid trip, especially in Antarctica, my recommendation is do it. It's absolutely worth it. If you made it this far, truly thank you so much for watching what has been somewhat of a chaotic experience, but so fulfilling. And don't forget to hit subscribe, follow along for more. There's definitely gonna be more travel adventures, more food adventures, and so much more to come.